can do particle physics. And the reason that I find particle physics interesting is it explains to us what we are made of. And that was the thing I was always really interested in. So we start with matter. Matter is just stuff. And stuff, as you all know, is made of atoms. And then atoms, well, they're made of smaller things. They have this nucleus in the middle and the electrons going around the outside. And then the nucleus is made of even smaller stuff. It's made of protons and neutrons. And then what we found out by doing particle physics experiments over 50 years at CERN and at other labs is that those protons and neutrons are actually made of even smaller things. And we call them quarks. So is anyone doing higher physics right now? Yes, yeah, so you will have heard of quarks. Is anyone going to do higher physics? Yes, so you will learn all about quarks and higher physics. Um, so they're just a the name that we give them, but there's three of them there. So there's the proton and the neutron, the two different kinds of things that are in the nucleus. And like I said, they're made up of three quarks. Now they're not made up of the same things, they're made up of two different kinds of quark, and we call them up quark and down quark. I don't know where the names come from, that's just what we use. But the proton has got two up quarks and one down quark, and the neutron has got two down quarks and one up quarks. So, what are we made of? <coughs> well, at least the atoms in our bodies are made up of three, what we call fundamental particles, the up quarks, the down quarks, and the electrons. And that's actually pretty simple, given that we're all different. But we're all made of just three fundamental particles. So fundamental um, just means that, that as far as we know, they're not made of anything smaller. They are the smallest things. But the story doesn't end there. I mean, otherwise I wouldn't have a job. Does anyone know where this is? This is in Scotland. Scotland's highest mountain. This is Ben Nevis. So what's Ben Nevis got to do with what we're made of? Well, this um, gentleman here is CTR Wilson, Charles Wilson. And he was born just 15 kilometers from here. So he's Scottish. Um, and he was a cli climate scientist that we call him. He was interested in the weather. He was interested in clouds. So he went up to Ben Nevis and um, he started seeing strange things happening in the clouds. So let me skip forward here. Um, and he went back to his lab and he created something we call a cloud chamber. So he made artificial clouds in the lab. And he managed to see the same strange phenomena that he'd seen up on Ben Nevis in the lab. So this is what he saw. These are actual pictures from his work um, from 1912. So this is over 100 years ago. And he saw these traces here. So they seem to have some kind of pattern. And what they are, they're from cosmic rays. So what's a cosmic ray? A cosmic ray is a piece of space dust that's flying through space and it hits the top of the Earth's atmosphere. When it hits the top of the Earth's atmosphere, it um, disintegrates into lots of little different pieces. Also has some kind of interactions with the molecules. And you can see all the different particles here. But the important one here is this thing here. It's got a mu, a Greek mu. We call it a muon. And these ones come all the way down from the top of the Earth's atmosphere down to Ben Nevis. And in fact, they even go through the Earth some distance. And that's what um, CTR Wilson had seen. <coughs> so he had discovered a muon. It's also a fundamental particle. But it's not one of the fundamental particles that makes us up. So he found something new that doesn't explain us. So that's quite interesting. Um, so muons appear to be like heavy electrons. Um, but they're not made up of electrons. They're just like a kind of heavy electron. So we start to see extra particles. This is the sun, and the sun 
emits a lot of light and heat, which is great when you live on Earth. Um, but it also emits another kind of particle called a neutrino. So if you put your hand out towards the sun, let me think, the sun's maybe kind of over there. Can you all stick your hand up? Do you feel the neutrinos going through your hand? But there is neutrinos that have come from the sun that are going through your hand right now. There's in fact about 10 to the power 11 neutrinos going through your hand right now. And that's going to happen your whole life and you never do it. That's because they're really tiny um, and they don't interact. They just keep on traveling and they will keep on traveling throughout the universe. So all stars emit these neutrinos and they keep on traveling throughout the universe. But this is another fundamental particle. It's not an up quark or a down quark or an electron or even it's something else. And it's something else we think is fundamental. Um, and if you want to visit the sun, it's only eight light minutes away from Edinburgh. So I mean, I start to think, well, what am I made of? That's maybe not such an interesting question. I'm not that special. So what's the universe made of? Well. It turns out the universe is made up of the same kind of things that we talked about. So the visible matter in the universe is made out of these quarks. Um, and particles like the electron and neon. And the neutrinos, the kind of things that come from the sun. But we actually find there's more than I just introduced. So we've got these quarks up and down. We've got the electron, the neon that C.T.R. Wilson was seeing the neutrinos that come from the sun, and then some other quarks and leptons that we found along the way. And that's now what we think the visible matter, the stuff we can see in the universe is made of. So it's only 12 particles. That's not really that many, is it, to make up the whole complexity of the universe? Um, so this can get a bit confusing. So sometimes I like to think, well, what if these were Pokemon? Is anyone still playing Pokemon? <laughs> That's only the grown-ups. <laughs> Did you play Pokemon at some point? Yeah. Not just Right. So here's my electron. It's a Pidgey. And when you evolve a Pidgey, you get a Pidgeotto. See, this is great. Um, and when you have all the Pidgeotto, you get a Pidgeot. So these are all kind of the same kind of thing, aren't they? But they're like heavier versions of each other. And this is kind of what this pattern is. We get an electron, and then a heavier one, and then a heavier one. So they're all kind of the same, but they've got different masses, like they're heavier. And we can do the same for the quarks. This is a Weedle, a Kakuna, and a Beedrill. So you evolve this to this to this, and um, uh, now now I'm just lost. I, I, I used to play Pokemon Go, and so I didn't know all the names at some point. But you see, they're kind of heavier versions of each other. So that's kind of what we're seeing. Although there's 12 particles, they come in patterns. And there's also the neutrinos, which are a bit weird. And so the best way to think of them is they're is they're a bit like an Eevee and they can um, evolve in, in different ways. Apparently how EVs can evolve many ways in Pokemon Go. <coughs> um, now, particles uh, would be pretty boring if that's all they did, if they just existed. But luckily for us, they do more exciting stuff. They interact. So they don't just um, sit there in the atoms doing nothing. They do interact with each other. Um, how do they interact? So for the people that have done higher, you've probably talked about this. Um, they exchange other particles. So um, let's see if we can make a very poor demonstration of this. So I need a couple of volunteers that are willing to be some particles. Yes, please come down. Anyone else? Yes. Um, so I'm going to get you to be uh, some of the fundamental 
particles. So let's start with an electron. You're going to be an electron. And you're going to be a muon. And you're going to have opposite charge. So what does that mean if things have opposite charge? They don't. They, they do attract. They have opposite charge. Yeah, they have opposite charge. So I'm going to have you. No, I'm actually going to have you the same. So you're an electron and you're a muon. See, I'm a bit smaller. And I want you to throw the ball at each other. No, no, no. <laughs> what happens? Not very much. Can, can you take the recoil? Like, just. Yeah. So they're kind of re like repelled slightly from each other by exchanging this. So this is an exchange particle that transmits some kind of interaction between the electrons and the neurons. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you for another interaction. Um, so now I'm going to make you be quarks. So you're going to be an up quark and you're going to be a down quark. So you're inside a proton together. Um, the interaction particles for quarks act a bit differently. So they actually make things stick together. So what I want you to do, very gently, I hope we don't break anything, is try and throw the ball, so curse back round and hit some. <laughs> okay, this is not really going to work here, but that's the kind of idea. Sometimes the particles, the exchange particles, make things go further apart, and sometimes you can imagine the kind of swerving round and making things go a bit closer together. Right, so thank you very much. So these are the other exchange particles that we have. Um, they're called the photon, the gluon, the Z boson, and the W boson. <coughs> There's one more particle, and it's my favourite that I need to talk about. Um, so does anyone recognise this gentleman? He was my general relativity lecturer. Um, anyone? Um, Okay, oh, that's a bad that's great. Um, so this is Peter Higgs. Um, and he predicted something called the Higgs boson. He didn't call it the Higgs boson, but everybody named it after him because he was the first person to think about it. And he lives just two kilometers away. So Scottish scientists are really important um, in developing our understanding of the world that we live in. So, um, he wrote down these equations, so this is in the exam at the end of the day, so just let me know with them. Um, but um, you can see behind him, there's this little uh, shape here. Oh. And so, I hoped that I could buy something that was similar, uh, a Mexican hat. But the Mexican hat that I managed to buy isn't quite the same. But uh, never mind, let's see if we can still do it. So I need another volunteer. Yeah. We'll try this out. <coughs> so what we're going to look at is, is, see this kind of goes, it's a bit like a cup here, but it's got a little dimple in it. So if you can imagine some mixing hats kind of bend up at the top, and this is the dimple. I'm going to stick this on your head, is that OK? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> and I am going to um, drop the ball. Well, actually, can, can I just do it like this? So it's useful. Actually, can you give us a twirl around? <laughs> Does your hand change very much as she draws around? No. That means it's symmetric. So it doesn't really matter what angle you look at it from, it's symmetric. So if I wanted to add a ball to the hat, where would I have to put it for it to be symmetric? So it would still look the same as it turned around. Right in the middle, right? Is the ball going to stay in the middle? Oh no. No, it's going to fall off. So <laughs> this is where I was hoping there would be a wee rim. So if there was a rim, what would happen to the ball? If I put it in the middle, it, it would fall into the rib. Yeah, so whoa. So we can imagine it would be something like that. And actually, if there's a rim, 
As you turn around, can you turn around and we'll do this together? See, it's no longer symmetric, right? Because the ball stays in one little place. Um, okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> complicated, they were basically pointing this out, that if you have a shape like this and you put in something like a ball, it's not going to go in the middle, it's not going to be symmetric anymore, it's actually going to go and fall into this rim. Now I'm not going to go through the maths of this because it's a bit complicated, but basically we need this to explain why some of these exchange particles are heavy, that they're not massless. So this is a photon, it's the particle of light. Um, it has no mass, that's why it can travel at the speed of light, but these ones are heavy. And without Peter writing down these equations, without the Higgs boson, there's no way for us to explain theoretically why some of those exchange particles have mass. Oh, so I thought this would animate, but never mind. Um, so here, here's all the particles. We have the quarks and the leptons and also these force carrying particles, which I've put them as pokeballs because they kind of exchange the interactions between things. And this is the Higgs boson here. How am I doing for time? Good. How many minutes have I got? Ten. Okay, well, this has to be quick. Um, so then I thought, right, so let's explain a bit about the background of what I do and why I do it. But then I thought I'd actually tell you what I do, which is um, look for Higgs bosons and try and find out more about them. So I've brought a little simple recipe. So please, teachers, take note because you're going to be doing this um, after, when you get back in August, you're going to be doing some Higgs bosons, right? Right, so firstly, Take two protons, I get mine from CERN, but, but other sources of protons are available, and simply accelerate them to the highest possible energies that you can, and smash the protons together head on. Now, um, one in 10 billion collisions will form a Higgs boson particle. That's great, so you have to do this more than once. Um, bad news, once the Higgs boson is formed, it decays. It decays into other kinds of particles. And it does that after 10 to the minus 22 seconds. You've got to be quick. So I suggest that you just assemble a highly sophisticated, completely state-of-the-art detector around the collision point, and then use that to observe the particles from the Higgs boson decay. And then just finally repeat 20 to 40 million times a second for two to five years. Um, and you too can discover and analyze your own Higgs bosons. So I got a bit more detail on this, but um, we'll skip through some of them a bit quickly. So protons from CERN. The CERN protons come out of this. Can anyone identify what this is? Ah, it's a bottle of hydrogen gas. And you know that the hydrogen is just one proton and one electron. So that's where they get the protons from at CERN. Um, so CERN is an international collaboration. There's 22 mainly European countries, including the UK. So it is the UK Center for Particle Physics. It's also the French Center for Particle Physics, and the German Center for Particle Physics, and the Swiss Center for Particle Physics. We all share it together. And the reason that I use CERN for my experiments is it has the Large Hadron Collider. Um, so there's a, a line here showing where it is. If you actually go there, so this is just outside Geneva in Switzerland. If you actually go there, there's no big yellow line on the grass. It's basically a huge proton racetrack. Um, it's 27 kilometers around and it's about 100 meters underground and um, turns out that there's enough space in Edinburgh to build one if we wanted one ourselves. Um, that would be great. Uh, what's the proton racetrack? Well it basically speeds up the protons 
to uh, 99.99999, I always get this wrong, ish percent speed of light. But in the museum here, there are actually two similar devices. So this one is in the big hall. Um, oops. It's a Cockcroft Walton um, accelerator. Uh, it would be used to uh, give lots of energy and therefore speed up some particles. So this is what we used to use. Um, and this is also a piece of an accelerator from CERN that's also in the museum in the science gallery on the top floor um, that we, we used to use. We don't use it anymore because it's now here um, at CERN. And then we replaced that with the, the large hadron collider. So it's just to show you that we've been doing experiments like this for a long, long time, and now they're so old they're in the museum. Um, so inside the LHC, if you went 100 meters underground, you'd see this. Um, this is cut away so you can kind of see what it's like. Basically, there's about 10,000 magnets, and they're used to bend the protons that are going at 99.9999 at the speed of light. They really, really, really want to go in a straight line. And I really, 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 really want them to go in a circle. And the reason I want them to go in a circle is I want to collide them together. If they're just going in a straight line, they miss each other. Um, so we have two sets of protons going around, one circling clockwise and the other circling anticlockwise. So you can see there's two holes here. So one of them has protons going clockwise and one of them is going um, anticlockwise. So they go parallel to each other for most of the 27 kilometers. But at four points in the ring, instead of going parallel, the magnets make them, not parallel, but just kind of hit each other head on. And then they keep on going. Most of them don't actually hit, they just kind of keep on going. But some of them hit. Um, nobody knows what it looks like because it happens so quickly. Um, but uh, it might look a bit like this. It's a bit of a mess. The reason we do that is because one in 10 billion of those collisions will form a Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson, unfortunately, unfortunately decays. Um, and this is a, a quilt work. Um, so someone's made a quilt uh, displaying what it might look like. Um, and so to do that, all you need to do uh, to, 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 to um, look at that process, at the Higgs boson being made and then decaying, you can assemble a highly sophisticated state-of-the-art detector around the collision points. So this is a computer-generated drawing of an experiment that I work on. It's called the ATLAS experiment. This is the ATLAS detector. Um, there's some people for scale. Uh, this is the museum here. This is the artist's impression when they were um, refurbishing it a number of years ago. And if we want to put Atlas inside the museum, along with the Cockroft Walton uh, generator, it would basically fill that whole big hall there. So when you're back out from the big hall, have a loop up and to the side, my detector would take up that entire space. And here's a picture um, in real life. Uh, you might have seen this kind of picture before. This is when they were building it. Um, so it's not just an artist's impression that actually exists. Um, this is in a bit more detail <coughs> what it looks like. And there it is, just um, underground. And we do that to observe the particles produced from the Higgs boson decay. Uh, and then we repeat 20 to 40 million times a second for our two to five years, and we just watch. So here's a little video of putting everything together. So these are the protons, and they're going to go around a series of different proton racetrack accelerators before they finally go into the huge LHC, the one that would go around the whole of Edinburgh. So we've got two protons um, going around, and we're going to go inside the tunnel 100 meters underground. You see Peter Hicks has been doing graffiti inside the tunnel. <laughs> The tunnel actually goes between France and Switzerland, so it goes under an international border. And so here's our proton with our three quarks inside it. And it's going to go towards the Atlas detector, 
And the other photon's going to come in the other way here. And they're going to collide in the middle of the detector. And then the bit that we don't see. So they made a Higgs boson, and the Higgs boson decays. And then our detector detects what the Higgs boson decays into. So here, it's decayed into two photons, two particles of light. Right. And then, this is when I wish I'm an astronomer, because we make these really terrible histograms. Do you remember doing histograms on primary school? Yep. No. But you counted, like, whose favorite pet is a cat? And we made a cat. Whose favorite pet? And that, I always thought that was the most simple kind of graph you could do. That's what you do. And we see this little bump in the graph. And we get very excited. And the reason we get very excited is that little bump there is caused by the Higgs boson um, being created in the detector and decaying into two particles of light. So that's the data we find. I'll just skip over this because um, it's not super illuminating. We still see a bump. So we take more data and we, we keep seeing bumps. So that's great. Um, and then uh, if uh, you're Peter Higgs, there's a ninth step in this process, which is the work for lunch. <laughs> instead of taking, staying home to take phone calls from Sweden. And that's because um, Peter Higgs here, he lives just two kilometers away, and François Anglais um, from Brussels um, won the Nobel Prize because they thought, over 50 years ago now, they both thought of this idea that I was talking about with the Mexican hat of putting a shape into the model and explaining why some of the fundamental particles or how some of the fundamental particles have mass. Right, so in just the last minute I'll tell you. Right, so that's what I've been doing. Um, the LHC has been running for over 10 years now and it's going to keep on running and you might think, well Victoria, you found out all you want to know, you found out about your quark and your leptons and your neutrinos and your bosons and you've been doing this experiment for 10 years, surely that's enough. No, there's a lot more to do. So we talked about the fact that the visible matter in the universe is made out of quarks and leptons. But it turns out there's actually invisible matter in the universe, stuff that we just can't see. And it's not, CERN has found this out. Uh, one of the ways we find this out is from this satellite, it's called the WMAP satellite, and it took a picture of the temperature of the early universe. And I don't work on this project, so I can't tell you exactly how they analyzed the data, but they found out that only 4.9% of the universe, in some way of accounting for it, is made of quarks and leptons. Now, I've spent my whole life <coughs> thinking about quarks and leptons and what I've made of and it turns out I was only ever studying 4.9% of the universe. And this makes me a bit sad. So uh, there's this extra fraction called dark matter, and there's this huge fraction called dark energy. But we think this thing is matter, so it's stuff at least. And we think at CERN we might be able to work out what this is. Um, so that most of the particles in the universe are not quarks and leptons, there's something else. So we don't know what it is. We've got some ideas and we give them names, of course. We call them dark electrons, neutralinos, gravitinos, wimps. But we don't really know what it is. But that's what we are looking for now for the LHC. So hopefully, in those collisions, some of the time we make Higgs bosons, but maybe, and we don't know for sure yet, but some of the time we're actually making something like this as well. And then we can use our experiments to detect it. Um, OK, so just uh, going along with the Pokemon analogy, we're going to catch all of the different Pokemon in our detector, including the ones that might explain dark matter, <coughs> and analyze them and find out about them. OK, uh, thank you very much for listening.